Welcome back to the Deer Show. Um, on my last show, I talked a lot about the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. Um, I compared and contrasted the right of abortion to the right to bear arms and got hundreds and hundreds of letters. And so what I thought I would devote this show to was really an analysis of the Bill of Rights and the Constitution and how it relates to unenumerated rights. And of course, there is no right of abortion in the Constitution, and there are at least words that say the right to bear arms in the Constitution. So uh, let's talk about that. But any discussion of the Bill of Rights has to begin with the words them, themselves. Now, the words of the Bill of Rights have been obviously modified o over the years. The first word of the Bill of Rights uh, <clears throat> has been abolished, essentially. The first word of the Bill of Rights is Congress. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech. Congress shall make no law. And always remember Justice Frankfurter, who was an advocate of judicial restraint. When there'd be a First Amendment case, he would he would bang on the table, and he would say, Congress, it says Congress shall make no law. It doesn't say that state legislatures can't make a law. And Justice Black would say, it says Congress shall make no law. Emphasize the word no. So it really depends on which word you emphasize. Obviously, with the passage of the 14th Amendment, um, justices began to what's known as incorporate the Bill of Rights selectively into the Constitution. So the Supreme Court held, and it's now pretty much established law, that the First Amendment is incorporated in whole into the Constitution, and therefore the states cannot do what Congress can't do. So just reread the First Amendment now to say, Congress, state legislatures, governors, executives, no government entity, no government entity shall make a law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That obviously gives rise to the case that's now pending, the Kennedy case, public school. Can they allow, can they permit, uh, can they prohibit a coach from saying a prayer uh, at the end of a game, in this case it was a Christian prayer, would the rules be the same if it was a Muslim prayer, or Hindu prayer, or Jewish prayer, or, 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 or an atheist, whatever they say, uh, non-prayer. Because the First Amendment not only prohibits any government entity from establishing religion, it also prohibits them from denying the free exercise thereof. And many people think there's a little bit of a conflict. Um, if you deny people the free exercise, um, maybe you're running afoul of the Establishment Clause, and if you have too much focus on the Establishment Clause, maybe you prevent free exercise. Obviously, Kennedy had the free exercise right to pray, but would allowing him to pray as a government official, essentially, establish a religion? That's the case that's coming before the court. I will give you a prediction with 100% guarantee of certainty, and I'm always right about these things, Every tribe is always wrong about these things, and um, um, uh, CNN is always wrong about these things. The Supreme Court will find a way to uphold Coach Kennedy's right uh, uh, to play one way or another, to pray, to play, and to pray, to combine playing and praying. And that's the concern for some. He's a coach, and he could take it out on players if they didn't pray. That was Justice Kagan's. Uh, concern. So that's the First Amendment. Now, the Second Amendment, there was a lot of letters about the Second Amendment, and they all started with laying out the second clause of the Second Amendment. The second clause of the Second Amendment says the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. If that's all the Second Amendment said, there'd be no controversy, but there was controversy for 200 years. For 200 years, not only the Supreme Court, but all the lower courts read the second part in conjunction with the first part. And here's the entire Second Amendment in whole. By the way, it gets a D minus for draftsmanship. It's a terribly drafted amendment precisely because it gives rise to the kind of confusion that we're talking about now. It says, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to bear, to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Another way of reading this is to say that it really reads, because 
a well-regulated militia is necessary to the security of a free nation. Therefore, the people must have a right to bear an arm, bear and and uh, keep arms, because otherwise there couldn't be a militia. Militias required people to have guns in their houses, and when the militia call was made, they would gather together, as in the bridge in uh, Concord and Lexington. We all know the history and and the story and so forth. 200 years, uh, there was no individual right to bear arms or to keep arms. It was only a collective right based on the a well-regulated re militia being necessary to the security of a free state. Now, there are some who say that the right to bear arms has to do not with the security of the state, but with overruling the state, with revolting. It's a right of revolution. Um, Jefferson talked about revolution being a right, but he wasn't at the con Constitutional Convention. His impact on the Constitution and the Bill of Rights is, is, is very, very little. Um, obviously, Madison, Hamilton, and Jay had a much greater impact, and not only through the Constitutional Convention, but through the Federalist Papers as well. And the Second Amendment has a lot to do with history. Hamilton wanted there to be a standing U.S. Army. Jefferson didn't. Uh, he thought militias, state militias were better. You know, it was a great conflict between states' power. It's a misnomer to say states' rights. States don't have rights. States have powers between state power and federal power. And it was the job of the Constitution to allocate various powers to the states and to the federal government, which brings us to, obviously, the Ninth Amendment, the Ninth Amendment and the Tenth Amendment. Let's start with the Tenth Amendment, actually, because we're talking about powers. And uh, the Tenth Amendment talks about powers, the Ninth Amendment talks about rights, and people often confuse that. The Tenth Amendment, the powers, powers, not rights, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited to it by the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. The powers, the powers. It says nothing about rights, it's powers. And then we have the Ninth Amendment. And the Ninth Amendment is crucial, obviously, to the argument for abortion. Um, and it says, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights, and abortion is not among them, the enumeration of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. So the question is, is the right of a woman to have an abortion one of those rights reserved to the, the people? And if it's the people, is it individual people or the collective people? These are, these, are hard, these are hard questions. To answer them, you also have to look at the Fourth Amendment. A lot of my letters started by saying, you know, the Second Amendment is clear. The right of the people to bear arms shall not be infringed. You know, clear if you don't read the first part of it. But there's nothing about privacy in the Bill of Rights. Got to correct you on that one. There is something about privacy in the Bill of Rights. It's in the Fourth Amendment. Let me read you from the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment says the right, this is not power, this is rights, the right of the people to be secure in their persons. Secure in their persons. But it doesn't say privacy. You know why not? The word hadn't been invented. Go check with 1793 dictionaries. The word privacy is not there, certainly not in this context. The word that was used by the framers in the way we use privacy today is security. So if we were rewriting the Fourth Amendment, we would probably say the right of the people to maintain privacy of their person houses or papers. After all, what does it, security of papers mean? It means the privacy of papers. What does the security of houses mean? It means your house is your castle. You have the right of privacy. So security is in the Fourth Amendment. It's in the Fourth Amendment twice. It's in the Fourth Amendment uh, both explicitly and implicitly through the Ninth Amendment, because even though it's not enumerated specifically, it hasn't been taken away if it is a right that's retained by the people. So, you know, it begs the question to just 
focus on the words as if the words themselves solved all the problems. They, they, they didn't solve all the problems. And, um, people wrote to me as well about, well, you know, we've seen so many decisions overruled. Plessy versus Ferguson was overruled. Uh, separate but equal was held unconstitutional. Well, but there was a reason for it. There had been changes. Uh, social science data showed that with the legacy of slavery, putting black children in separate schools sent to them and their teachers and their funders a message of inequality. That took years to document. And so by 1954, the information had changed, and there was a reason for overruling uh, a 56-or-so-year-old um, uh, opinion. Uh, nothing has changed in Roe versus Wade. Uh, if anything has changed, it's you know probably changed to give women more rather than fewer rights. But nothing has really changed. Nothing as dramatic as as uh, Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, the only reason the Supreme Court is able to overrule Roe versus Wade is just because they have the votes to do it and they got them in properly as a result of the Republicans denying uh, Merrick Garland uh, even a hearing um, for his role in the Supreme Court. So, you know, there are, there are real, real uh, differences. And, and, and uh, as I've said before, and, you know, this was controversial when I said it last time, don't compare a woman's possible right to have an abortion with two gay men's right to have sex or a black man's right to marry a white woman. There's no comparison. When it comes to sex and marriage, it's nobody's business except the people who are doing it. By John Stuart Mill's notion, the state has no right to interfere if there are only two people involved and they both consent. If two people consent to have uh, homosexual sex, that's the end of the matter. Nobody else's business. Nobody else's business at all. I may have told you this before, but I remember um, I went to an Orthodox synagogue in uh, Miami Beach, Florida. Uh, it must be five, six years ago. And I made a speech, and in the speech I talked about gay rights and uh, the right of men to marry each other and women to marry each other. And this Orthodox Jewish woman got up and said, there's no right to, uh, for gay people to marry each other. It makes me feel terrible to know that there are two gay men having sex with each other in the privacy of their bedroom. If I know that's happening, it's deeply disturbing to me. So I said, ma'am, are you married? She said, yes, I'm married. I said, I'm going to ask you one simple question. You're not going to like it, but I'm going to ask it to you. When you and your husband have sex, are you on top or is he on top? She was appalled. How dare you ask me that question? It's none of your business. I said, aha, uh -huh. and it's none of your business if two men have sex in the privacy of their bedroom. I may be appalled to learn that you're on top. It's none of my business. You may be appalled to know that two men are having sex. It's none of your business. Mind your own business was a very early slogan of several states in the United States. Don't tread on me and mind your business. Mind your business. We are not a nation of busybodies. And so it's nobody's business who marries each other and who has sex with each other. Abortion's different. Abortion is different. Whatever you may feel about a woman's right to choose abortion or whether a fetus is or is not a human being, there comes a time. Is it in the second trimester? Is it in the third trimester? There comes a time when an abortion is not simply a woman's right to control her body. There comes a time when an abortion involves something else. It involves the killing of a potential life, it may involve pain. We're not sure. There's a heartbeat. Uh, you can say it's incidental, but it's something. It's different than what's involved in gay marriage. And so it's very, very important to understand those differences. We'll, we'll explore these differences in the Constitution a little bit more in a minute. But uh, first, let me uh, just read to you from my favorite um, uh, company that are uh, sponsoring this uh, podcast. And so, do you own a small business or need to help grow it? Then anthemsoftware.com is your one-stop solution. 
Anthem software helps small businesses all over America to find, to serve, to keep more customers' profitability by providing world-class CRM software and results, results-focused marketing services, your business will not only grow, but dominate in this highly competitive commercial world. That's AnthemSoftware.com. Every business has a song. So let AnthemSoftware.com help you sing yours. Visit AnthemSoftware.com to schedule your free demo of this amazing solution. So let's get back to um, the Constitution. Um, it was uh, John Marshall, the fourth Chief Justice of the United States, and probably its most influential, he wrote, Marbury versus Madison, he presided over the treason trial of um, uh, Burr, of Aaron Burr, uh, that resulted in his uh, finding of not proven. He wasn't found not guilty, just not proven. But Marshall wrote that it's a constitution we're expounding, and a constitution that's designed to last through the ages. And the reason the constitution has successfully outlived any other constitution in the history of the world, no other written constitution has ever lasted as, as long it's because it has some flexibility at the joints. It, sure, it has some very specific provisions that can't be interpreted 35 years old to be president, 30 years old to be a senator, 25 years old to be a congressman. You can't be 24 and a half. You can't be 35 and a half to be president. 34 and a half, you have to be 35. Okay, but then you get equal protection of the laws. Obviously, that cries out for interpretation. Cruel and unusual punishment cries out for interpretation. The due process of law. The establishment of religion. These are things that change uh, over time. They have a different meaning today than they did um, uh, 200 and something uh, years ago. So is it a living constitution or is it a dead constitution? Parts of it are living, parts of it are dead. Um, and everybody would have to acknowledge that. When I debated Antonin Scalia, he invited himself essentially to debate me in my class in criminal law, one of the first years in which he was uh, a justice. Um, I put to him the issue of Brown versus Board of Education. I said, how does your dead constitution allow Brown versus Board of Education? The framers of the constitution, when they wrote the 14th Amendment, did not have in mind integrated schools, certainly didn't have in mind integrated marriages. Um, and his answer was very honest. He was an honest guy. He said, my originalism doesn't solve all the problems. It doesn't solve Brown versus Board of Education but it's better than all the other methods of interpretation, imperfect as it is. And that's always been my approach to the Constitution. It's an imperfect document. I think it was Thurgood Marshall said it was born with a birth defect. And the birth defect was slavery, obviously, three-fifths votes. Uh, I think it has many other birth defects. Uh, my own view is the Electoral College has that grown its usefulness. And if I were rewriting the Constitution, I wouldn't write in the Electoral College. I wouldn't write in the Second Amendment if I were rewriting uh, the Constitution. But I believe that the Second Amendment should be interpreted uh, in a reasonable way. Um, I like to focus on the words, a well-regulated militia, meaning that the framers of the Second Amendment understood that regulation of guns was essential. That You can't have militias that are not well-regulated, and you can't have gun ownership that's not well-regulated. So. For me, the compromise has always been a well-regulated right to bear arms, well-regulated by um, uh, having tests for people, uh, having um, exclusions for people uh, who have records of violence, et cetera, et cetera, um, waiting periods, a range of other reasonable, and also that states should have some authority, cities indeed, to have a different rule for different parts of the country, even Take one state or, or two states, California and New York. Both states have major urban and suburban areas where guns should be less available than they are in rural areas. Um, in rural areas, we have hunting and people are isolated. Maybe their gun rules should be different than they are in the Bronx uh, or in Brooklyn or in downtown Los Angeles. But reasonable people could disagree about that. Well-regulated would give that kind of um, uh, flexibility. So my two lessons uh, for today as a, a teacher is read the Constitution carefully. Read all of the provisions. Don't just isolate one provision. When you read the Second Amendment, 
read the part about a well-regulated militia. Read the part about the, the power is not delegated. Read the part about the enumeration of certain rights. And read the Fourth Amendment, um, the right of the people to be secure in their persons. Third Amendment, by the way, nobody knows the Third Amendment, has something to do with privacy as well. The Third Amendment says, uh, no soldier shall in time of peace be quarantined in any house without the consent of the owner, uh, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law, that your home is your castle. And yeah, you may have to quarter soldiers there, but but uh, not during peacetime, and only as regulated by law. So, you know, privacy was understood. Brandeis talked about the, the right to be left alone as the most fundamental right that um, Americans have. Uh, so it's part of our part of our fabric of, of governance. Does it solve the abortion issue? No, it doesn't. Does it solve the Second Amendment? No, it doesn't. Does it solve really any any major controversial issue? It, it gives guidance, uh, but it doesn't necessarily solve the most complex problems of life. Okay, let's see what some of my questions are. Well, two of them I really have answered. Professor riddle me this. What does the Second Amendment say? It says, quote, the right of the people to bear arms shall not be in French. Again, leaving out the, uh, the other uh, part of it. Another one, though, was closer to the truth, and this is actually correct. The Second Amendment is far closer to affirming the right of an individual to bear arms, if you believe it doesn't outright do so, which I do, than any section of the Constitution that grants the supposed right to abortion. I agree with that. I think the right to bear arms is a clearer case uh, for a constitutionally protected right absent the Ninth and Tenth Amendments than, um, than uh, the Second Amendment. So I, I, I do think that you make a good a good point. Uh, so let's get to some other issues. Could the justices petition a state bar association to revoke the leaker's law license? Yes. And they probably would. And uh, Or to prevent the leaker from getting a law license. I, I don't even think the Supreme Court would have to do it. I think bar associations would themselves um, have a uh, look askance at a young woman or man who violated their uh, oath of secrecy to the to the Supreme Court. Now, here's a dumb one. Again, you got to have some dumb ones along with the intelligent ones. This is a paranoid, dumb, possibly racist one. Um, is it just a coincidence that there have never been leaks in the Supreme Court before Katanji Brown's nomination? Hmm. I know she's not actually on the Supreme Court seat quite yet, but I'm sure she still has access to information. No, in fact, she doesn't. Um, and nor do her law clerks, and it's a bit of paranoia to focus on her. She is uh, the least likely uh, 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 suspect. Uh, okay. Here's one who states his political views. I agree with Dershowitz on both gun control and abortion issues, and yet Trump is still the best choice for a POTUS in 2024. That's America. You have your right. Okay, here's one that relates to an event that uh, just happened. What is the shoe in the other foot test for the Harvard Crimson? Now, the Crimson wrote an editorial singling out only Israel, not uh, Russia, not Belarus, not China, uh, not Cuba, not uh, any of the other countries in the world, only Israel for a boycott, uh, blaming everything in the world on Israel. That's the Harvard Crimson. What if the Crimson had called on students to boycott products from all Muslim-majority countries? Do you think that President of Harvard and others would have the courage to speak out against the Crimson? Well, uh, President Backhead was a very decent man, a very good man, and an excellent president of Harvard, uh, did issue a statement. And uh, he did say that he's against uh, boycotts, but he wouldn't comment specifically on the Crimson uh, because the Crimson is not under the jurisdiction of Harvard. It's Harvard students, but it's a privately owned company. And uh, the president of Harvard can't tell them what to do, and they don't speak on behalf of Harvard. So he's taken the position that he won't speak on behalf of any of these issues. He won't condemn anything the Crimson says. He will just say that the Crimson has the right under the First Amendment to say whatever it wants and, and to be sure that you know that they don't speak for Harvard. That's a plausible position as long as it's maintained completely consistently. 
Okay, here's another one. That's interesting. Just curious, Professor Dershowitz, what is your opinion of the fact that Attorney General Garland, now we're talking about him as Attorney General, not as a nominee to the Supreme Court, Attorney General Garland has not condemned the leaking of the draft opinion, has not condemned death threats against the justices, has not condemned the doxing of their home addresses, and has not publicly expo proposed additional security for the justices. Alito had to cancel an appearance because of death threats. I thought liberals once condemned violence. I guess that has all changed. You say you were robbed um, by the Senate of having Garland appointed as a justice. In view of his conduct and statement since becoming AG, that is probably a blessing. I don't agree. I think he was robbed. I think he would have been a great justice. Having said that, if you're right, and I don't know that you're right, if you're right, he should have condemned the leak. He should be providing extra security for uh, justices. He should condemn um, um, any violent attacks or threats against the justice. Now, as far as pickets in front of people's houses, that's a hard issue. I wouldn't support picketing people's houses, but I think the First Amendment permits picketing houses as long as it's uh, a distance away and it's not too loud and it doesn't disturb the residents. There are all kinds of rules in terms of manner and place and location, but I don't think houses and homes are immune. I've had my house picketed. I once owned a little deli in Harvard Square uh, with a bunch of other guys and women, and uh, it was picketed. Um, and um, so, uh, you know, I think there is the right to picket and the right to um, uh, go to people's houses, but I would myself choose not to exercise that right. I think the person's home should be sacrosanct. Um, going back to abortion, I think the argument that a fetus is not a person in modern times will fail the test of constitutionality pretty much for similar reasons, that the 14th Amendment reversed previous amendments that held black and Indian people were not fully human. Enlightenment and science will prevail over archaic beliefs like the fetus is not a person. It's an interesting point. Obviously, you're right that the framers of the Constitution did not believe that um, Native people and black people were fully human in the sense that um, they were equal. Um, uh, the Declaration of Independence, still I have, have it hanging on my wall. It has a provision in it about calling Native Americans savages and their acts, savage acts. Now, there was brutality, obviously, on all sides, but the word conveys something that is not a term of, of equality. On the other hand, the idea that a fetus is like a fully grown um, African American or Native American person, obviously, isn't, uh, isn't correct either. Um, clearly, a three-day-old zygote or tiny fetus is very different from a fully grown uh, African-American woman or man or even child. Um, and uh, so the analogy is not apt, and I, I think the science is moving us in the opposite direction, and um, hopefully, eventually, the science will probably moot some of the issues regarding abortion. At the early side of abortion, probably the white availability of the pill um, will make early abortions medically unnecessary. And at the end of the pregnancy, the ability to remove from the womb uh, an eight and a half month fetus without harming the fetus or the mother will lead to the end of such third trimester abortions and the ability to deliver the child prematurely if necessary. And Put it up for adoption or whatever other options uh, there are. So, you know, I, I understand your point, but the analogy is not is not correct. Okay. Final question. We only have a minute, um, and that goes back to what the lesson of the day was, and it's a criticism of me for saying the First Amendment should be incorporated, but maybe the Second Amendment shouldn't be incorporated. Um, and the thrust of the question is that. Either everything should be incorporated or nothing should be incorporated. That's not the way the Supreme Court has handled this. Uh, they have engaged in what is called selective incorporation. The First Amendment has been 
incorporated. On the other hand, the grand jury provisions of the Fifth Amendment have not been incorporated. States don't have to have grand juries, and many states don't have uh, grand juries. They just have indictments or presentments or informations. Uh, so not all of the Bill of Rights have been incorporated, and so the question arises whether the Second Amendment should be uh, in incorporated. Uh, should the states and cities be denied the power to regulate um, guns and to exercise reasonable gun control, and reasonable people could disagree about that. The Supreme Court has decided that case and decided it in favor of incorporating uh, the Second Amendment, but that wasn't predestined. That could have gone uh, either way. So I don't know about you, but for me this has been an interesting seminar in constitutional law and the Bill of Rights. I miss you know my 50 years of teaching at Harvard. I wish I had an interactive ability to communicate with you directly rather than through written questions, and maybe someday we'll figure out that technology. But